the, this is we, we've got a lot of information here. I want to ask one one final question. I will just say, and I I want to thank all of the committee members for uh, great questions um, on both sides of the aisle. Um, the the one you know a lot of disappointments here with the information flow, uh, not getting to where it needs to be, but also the response. Uh, again, um, what's a credible what's a credible threat? Many of us would think that that information that was being presented was a credible threat. Uh, the the lack of pushing uh, from you guys on your side, um, both Chief Sund and yourself, to push the board to have a vote, um, to, to push harder and harder because of, you know, the end result is the rank and file men and women uh, ended up, you know, being and put in a situation that, that we believe they shouldn't have been in the lack of equipment. Uh, clearly, there wasn't a review of the training. I mean, I was here after the, the years ago when the governor of Kentucky's plane started flying in the airspace coming towards the Capitol and the evacuation for, from us was run like hell. You know, we were all just running out. So that was, I can't remember, 10 plus years ago, um, if not more. Um, so there were all there's all these issues that that we absolutely need to deal with moving forward. The one question that I get most when I'm home in Northeast Ohio uh, is the issue around the use of force, um, because it was it was clear that that the men and women on the front lines weren't sure what to do as far as how to respond to what was happening, and again that tells me that there wasn't the the level of training beforehand on uh, or clarity coming from command throughout the incidents which we've heard from multiple occasions from many of the rank and file members so what was the use of force a uh, rules of engagement policy for the the rank and file members on january 6. so the u.s uh capitol police use of force policy has not changed Based on the type of event that we're responding to, our officers are required to use the amount of force that's necessary in any given situation. However, as it relates to lethal force, our officers are only permitted to engage in lethal force for the protection of life, uh, either their own or to protect another person's life. As it relates to for the protection of property, our officers did use less than lethal force, which is what they're permitted to do. Based on that, though, I acknowledge that there are additional uh, resources that this department needs. There is additional training that is needed for our officers. I, too, have been posed those same questions as it relates to use of force. So at this point, I have directed specific commanders, uh, those persons in charge, of the Training Services Bureau to work along with uh, the CAO as well as our general counsel to provide that specific guidance to our officers. So we are leaning forward uh, with the direction that uh, those persons in charge of those areas of responsibility mm -hmm. will lead the charge in making sure our officers have the training that they need going forward. Well, I, I hope you understand our frustration and uh, you weren't in charge, but you were one of the leaders uh, in, in the, at the Capitol Police on that day in the days leading up. And it's really frustrating for us who have become friends with so many of these uh, rank and file members who take care of us every single day here to watch them be put in a position where they're not told clearly what, what they can do to protect themselves. And they got kids and they got spouses. And, and as you said, they're your friends too. But, you know, we've got to make sure that the leadership of the Capitol Police uh, is operating and functioning at a very, very high level, especially in this current environment. And uh, I, I know you can tell from the committee uh, here and, and rank and file members of Congress who don't sit on this committee are extremely disappointed, extremely concerned that, that these guys, men and women that we love, uh, were put in this position. And you look at the lack of communication, you look at the lack of, you guys, you guys didn't even see the FBI threat assessment. You know, so it's one thing to say, look, I mean, you know, we didn't, we didn't see it, but even if we did, 
uh, it wouldn't have changed things. Well, that's fine, but you need to see that stuff. I mean, what, what, is, the, what is the information flow over there? Uh, and, and how does it not make its way? Because you said you didn't even see it, right? Did you, you, weren't, you didn't see the FBI uh, report, and nor did Chief Sun. That, that is mind-boggling to us, how given everything going on, the FBI issues a, some kind of report that, that confirms your, your uh, intelligence, and it, it never makes its way to the chief of police or never made its way to you? I mean, what, what's going on? You know, I mean, these are these are legitimate questions, and I know you're doing daily calls and all of that. But I think, at some level, it's it's about judgment, and it it speaks to um, being able to run an efficient operation that allows for the kind of information flow in this day and age, where we're picking up an enormous amount of intelligence, making sure that the right intelligence gets to the right people in a timely manner, and then the response is appropriate. That's the key. There is to get the intelligence. And, and have the guts uh, to tell uh, the Paul Irving or the sergeant at arms, like, you know, I'm not leaning in. I'm leaning into you to have a vote with the police board. And, and look, it takes a lot of nerve to be in a leadership position today like the one you're in. And we commend you for your service and your leadership and your, you know, everything you bring to bear. Um, but this is, you know, minute by minute, Things can go sideways here, and uh, we've got to be pushing you and the department to, to run at a very and function at a very very high level because mistakes made at, the, at your level uh, lead to what what happened here on the sixth. And um, you know we're we're here to support you. That's our job on the appropriations committee is making sure you have the resources that you need. But you know you've got to be clear with us. You've got to make sure you're executing. I mean these issues around equipment. It's hard to believe that that uh, men and women of the Capitol Police don't have the didn't have the equipment that they need, um, and and so I've made my point. We've taken up a lot of your time today. You know, please uh, know that we appreciate your work, and we we know how difficult it is, um, but we've got to expect the best, and 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 that's what the American people tell us that we have to do, and that's our mission here. As I said in my opening statement, to we're just caretakers here. You know, we come in and we come out and, you know, your position too, people come in and out of, we're caretakers. And so we've got to make sure that in this moment with everything going on, we've got to, we got to rise to the occasion and, um, and, and the American people deserve that. So I want to thank you, uh, Chief Pittman. I want to thank uh, Tim. Thank you so much. We're going to thank continue you, to be in dialogue. Again, I encourage you, Chief, to make sure you are trying to communicate to the press the best you can. I want to thank our staff on the committee uh, and all the members of this committee for, for a good hearing, and we'll continue to be in very, very close touch. Uh, with that, this hearing is adjourned.